you know, it really makes me think about um, this building. Of course, we're here on the water. Um, but also about President Kennedy and what we do here, which is talk about public service. And storytelling like that and journalism like that is a true public service to our city and our country. So congratulations, David, um, on what you've accomplished in bringing these, uh, this issue to life. For those of you who are just joining us online, I'm Rachel Floor. I'm the executive director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. And on behalf of all of my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you um, who are joining us this evening uh, for the conversation online. I'd also just like to again acknowledge our, the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors, Bank of America, the Lowell Institute and CVS Health, as well as the Mass Cultural Council and our media sponsor, the Boston Globe. Tonight's program is also made possible in part through the generous support of the James M. and Kathleen D. Stone Foundation. Jim and Kathy Stone are leaders in our community around issues of equity and climate solutions and also great uh, supporters and champions of the JFK Library. They're here tonight and say we thank you for your support. <laughs> we are looking forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. So if you're online, you'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. And when the Q&A starts here in person, we'll invite those of you um, who are in the audience to proceed to the microphones um, to ask your questions as well. I'm now delighted to introduce our panelists for this evening and welcome Joe Christo, the Managing Director of the Stone Living Lab, to the library tonight. Prior to joining the lab, he served as the Senior Resilience and Waterfront Planner for the Boston Planning and Development Agency and launched equitable infrastructure and economic mobility programs as a program director at the City of Boston Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, the city's civic innovation team. Previously, he spent seven years working on community resilience projects for the City of New York and as the communications director for the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy in Boston. It's also a pleasure to welcome Sanjay Seth, Chief of Staff, Staff and Senior Advisor for Climate and Equity for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Region 1. He also serves as a lecturer at Harvard where he teaches on climate change, urban planning, and public policy. Previously, he managed the City of Boston's Climate Ready Boston program, which focuses on implementing a multi-billion dollar climate resilience plan to help prepare Boston for the impacts of climate change and on an interdisciplinary cons consultant team on behalf of the City of New York to help plan to protect New York from the impacts of climate change. I would look up at you all, but I can't see anything. So. <laughs> I'm also so glad to welcome Julie Wormser, the Senior Policy Advisor at the Mystic River Watershed Association. She co-founded and co-facilitates the Resilience Mystic Collaborative, a voluntary partnership among 20 cities and towns working together to protect people and places from extreme weather. Prior to joining my, uh, my RWA, is that how you guys? <laughs> she was a Senior Policy Director at a variety of nonprofit organizations. As executive director of the Boston Harbor Association, Julie was instrumental in drawing attention to Boston's need to prepare for close coastal flooding from extreme storms and sea level rise. Finally, I'm delighted to welcome David Abel to the library tonight. A Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who covers climate change for the Boston Globe, he is also a professor of the practice at Boston University. He has, his work has won an Edward R. Murrow Award the Ernie Pyle Award from the Scripps Howard Foundation, and the Sigma Delta Chi Award for feature reporting. Abel, who began learning to make films as a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, is Inundations District's producer, director, writer, and cinematographer. David, thank you for sharing your film with us this evening and for moderating tonight's discussion. Please join me in welcoming our special guests.
hi, everybody. Um, Rachel, thank you so much for that introduction. I um, have a hard time imagining a better venue for this film. Uh, it's also really meaningful for me to be able to show this film here on, on multiple levels. Um, you might recall, I don't know if you were uh, here then, a decade ago, I showed my first feature film here uh, about the Boston Marathon bombings. Mm. Um, and so uh, it's really special to be back here. And um, uh, I used to also come here quite frequently for lunch uh, when my office at the Boston Globe was just across the street. Mm. So uh, I, I, uh, this place is you know, in my heart. Um, I want to say a special thank you to Liz Murphy for uh, organizing so much tonight. So I appreciate uh, everything you've done uh, to gather such a great audience. Uh, thank you to James and Kathleen Stone for making uh, this possible tonight. And of course, thank you to uh, this wonderful panel we have here, uh, all of whom I've learned quite a bit from, uh, Julie, Sanjay, and Joe. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, uh, being here. Um, so we premiered this film in October. And since then, I have been doing a lot of uh, answering questions. As a reporter, uh, I am uh, far more comfortable asking them. So I am really happy to have the opportunity to do that tonight. Um, my plan is that I'm going to ask uh, three or so questions uh, that each of you will have an opportunity to respond to. Um, uh, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, I know that each of you could probably write something close to a dissertation on the questions that I'll ask, so please uh, keep your answers succinct. Um, with that, I will start uh, with the first question. Uh, and this is a question uh, that uh, I have heard uh, and has been asked of me, uh, but some of you guys have special uh, ability to tell uh, uh, to answer this question. So if you could go back in time, what specifically would you do differently about the building of the seaport? How would you have designed it differently to withstand rising seas and intensifying storm surges? And given what we know um, now about rising seas, would you have still built it? or encourage city officials not to build it. Uh, Julie, we'll start with you. Thank you very much, David. And I, we were all there at the time. And I remember advocating for the seaport to be built at the um, Summer Street level and to have the rest of it be floodable. And um, to, to do something similar as other places like Hamburg, Germany has done, or um, monsoon adapted places have done. Um, but I think, um, so that's, that's the short answer, is that it should have been built um, a story up and have the rest of it be usable for the 50 years that it's usable and then turned into Venice. <laughs> what, it, what is a story in terms of elevation? Like how much? Well, how how high is is you know maybe you'd be maybe you'd be twenty five feet you know at that kind of thing but you know up at the where Summer Street is a a bridge, that's a big story up. Right, got it. Okay, Sanjay. Well, so I I, I would just step back a bit from that question like when did we start even building the seaport right There's been I really liked at the beginning of the movie, where it started with um, talking about the tidal flats and talking about you know, the first thing that unlocked the seaport was this idea of using it as a rail yard or using it for this broader kind of infrastructure strategy. There's always been public involvement in the creation of this district. And um, the movie really goes into a lot of detail about, OK, well, we moved a highway. We buried a highway, and we moved a convention center. And we have a museum now and a courthouse. There's been so much public involvement with so many different hands that I think the story of the seaport is um, the story about a lot of public investment, which is there's no one person that decided to build the seaport. Now, if there was someone who could kind of wave their magic wand and say, all right, 
a city should look like this. You know, I don't, I don't know if you would pick the form that it's in today, mm -hmm. right? No kidding. And so, um, but the, the thing that I, that I reflect on, this is the third time I've, I've had an opportunity to watch your film, which sorry, I sorry, appreciate. <laughs> Um, it's a form of torture. No, no, that's I, what I'm doing. I, I think I'm going to torture I, the, all public officials no, by great. making them I'm, watch. I'm this really repeatedly. enjoying it. I feel like I'm catching more things each time. But um, the thing that I keep coming back to, and you can see it out the window here at the the library, is um, Deer Island, the wastewater treatment plant. So maybe this is too nerdy for folks, but there's that thing with the little kind of like mushroom metal thing. Okay, Logan. So I see a lot of nodding heads. That's that's a wastewater treatment plant. In 1989, they built it two and a half feet higher than they needed to uh, at the time because they, they had known. They had, they had known enough. So I think, I guess maybe not quite answering your question, but what I would say is we did know, right? We could know. For sure. And so <clears throat> the seaport's a choice, but every public investment is a choice. And we're in that choice moment right now because we're making deep investments all across the country in so many different ways not just in neighborhoods, but in roads and bridges. And I, I think we have a lot of opportunity to learn the lesson of the seaport right now. Thank you. Joe. Um, I also uh, wanted to quickly say thanks to, to Rachel and Liz and the JFK Library and Museum and uh, Jim and Kathy Stone as well for their support uh, tonight and I know the Stone Living Lab too. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what Julie and, and Sanjay said and you know, uh, I guess to ask a little more detail on your question. You know, we have the knowledge we have today, and how far back are we going? Are we going to when the, the trash and, and wine bottles were being dumped, uh, you know? In no, I, I would say um, the modern seaport took, started to take shape, at least in Blueprint in the 90s, late yeah. 90s, but it really started to take shape uh, over the last 10 or 15 years. I mean, just in the course of making this film uh, over a two-year two period, the landscape has changed significantly. Every time I would go down there to shoot, there would be new buildings. And I would say that in earnest, uh, after the federal court uh, took shape, which was what, in the 2005, 2010 mm -hmm. era, era, there has been an unremitting uh, burst of development there. So I'm saying, let's say, since Tom, former Mayor Thomas M. Menino declared uh, what Julie once called the uh, inundation district, the innovation district. Um, let's start there. Yeah, I, I do think then that, that Julie and, and Sanjay's points are, are, are right on point. And it does offer uh, a lot of lessons on, on what we can be doing better in the future. And I think, yeah, if there was an opportunity to um, really know what we know today and, and go back then, it, it probably would not and should not look the way it does today. Okay. Um, so to look to the present, uh, my next question, or series of questions, is if you could, um, as Sanjay said, wave a magic wand, what would you do now to protect the seaport and the rest of coastal Boston? Do you see a harbor-wide barrier as making any sense? Um, should we have some kind of coastal defense agency uh, that would be in charge of implementing solutions. Um, and perhaps most importantly, as I ask in the film, who should pay for that? Should it be the taxpayers or should it be the developers paying for it? Um, and we'll start with Joe. Um, you know, I appreciated in the film that you both uh, showed the uh, storm surge barriers in New Bedford and Bill Golden's perspective about the opportunities for an outer harbor barrier, and then talked about nature-based approaches as well, which is um, you know, going in a much different direction. That's what our Stone Living Lab focuses on, is studying how nature-based approaches can be used for climate adaptation here in Boston, how those lessons can be extracted for other cities uh, on the eastern seaboard and throughout the world. Um, you know that I recently got to spend a little bit of time in the Netherlands, and they've been dealing with this issue for 800 years. That same way that you saw the historic photographs of the way the seaport was filled in, that's what they did there, too, and 30% of the country is below sea level. I was there for the uh, annual test closure of the Mailsint storm surge barrier uh, this past fall. It's the largest moving object on Earth. Right? It took an hour and a half to close, and um, it was fascinating to see. 
Um, but the Netherlands is trying to get out of that business. They don't want these big, huge barriers anymore. That was completed in 1997. They haven't created another one since. And they're focusing more on nature-based approaches and shoreline adaptation. And uh, a Room for the River project is one of their key features to really allow to work with water instead of against it. So I would say, as Climate Ready Boston does, continuing to make sure that we're focusing on nature-based approaches instead of thinking about big gray infrastructure that a lot of cities are trying to move away from would be a, a preferred approach. Um, how, do, how does a nature-based approach, though, deal with 10 feet of sea level rise? Yeah, I mean, when you start talking with those numbers, that's, that's when you're talking about retreat, right? A nature-based approach buys you time, and it helps return certain areas where there has been a hardened shoreline um, into one that is a little bit more soft and, and is able to work with water. But yeah, the long-term solution in that scenario is retreat. Got it, okay. Julie. So I, I wanna back up and, and talk about like if I were truly czar, because you, you are, Julie. if I were truly <laughs> czar. No better, czar. So the, the only countries that are really tackling climate well are dictatorships and social democracies. <laughs> because they have really strong central planning and they can get stuff done. And if you, I had a friend from Shanghai who came here to the Kennedy School, and she said, it's taking you two years to do one subway station you know, in the government center. We build cities in two years, like whole cities, and that's true. So there are so many things that make Ma Massachusetts a, have a there there because we purposefully move slowly with a lot of input. That is why it's incredibly difficult to do collective action challenges like, like climate change, particularly something existential like sea level rise. So exactly where we could do the best work on climate is at the neighborhood level and at the multi-town level and those are the two places where we have no government to help, right? And Massachusetts, as much as we call it a home rule state, it's an anti-home rule state. It's incredibly difficult to raise money for something like a harbor barrier uh, locally. When we did the Big Dig, when we did the Boston Harbor cleanup, that was federal funding and that was utility funding. So. If I really were czar within the context of not being a social democracy or a dictatorship, I would create a utility that had, um, like, had very low risk tolerance in terms of flooding, where they could draw money um, you know, on an ongoing basis through flood bills. And that would pay for not just the seaport, but the um, existing neighborhoods that don't want to be redeveloped, if I truly sorry. <laughs> uh, when we have more time, I want to flesh that out and understand that better. Uh, and I'll appoint you dictator. Uh, Sanjay. Yeah, I think, I think one part of your piece, your question was around, and who pays, right? Mm -hmm. Which is usually the punchline to every public policy question is you can have great ideas, but how are we going to implement it? And so I think, the story, I think the lesson that the seaport gives us is um, it, it's not just about, OK, at the end, who's going to pay for this challenge that's been created, but who was involved to begin with in the creation of the seaport? Whose interests were at play? Who um, bears the burden now? Who benefited from the seaport? These are the questions that I think um, inform any public investment, including um, you know, the deep level of public investment that was required to unlock um, the seaport. I was um, last night. I was sitting there trying to think, how am I going to convey the amount of sewage that used to spill into Boston Harbor? <laughs> and it turns out it used to be about 3.3 billion gallons. Um, an Olympic swimming pool is around 500,000 gallons. So you're talking about 6,000 per, per day or per no, week or per yeah, year. Yeah, uh, 3.3 billion gallons of sewage per year on average. Back in the 80s, we're talking about before all this money was invested by Massachusetts mm -hmm. ratepayers through loans from the federal government to clean up the harbor, right? So when we're talking about who pays, who paid to unlock the harbor? It was folks, if you, if, I mean, if you were here in Massachusetts in the 80s, you know, it was folks who were ratepayers, um, it was folks who paid 
and invested in the big dig and all these things. So I guess when, when we talk about who pays now, right? How do we understand who paid then? And how do we think about equity in this context? But one, one thing I guess I just want to add to this conversation, if I can, is. Can I just push back on that, yeah. though? Because there were, there were the reasons why there was so much sewage in Boston Harbor was because of our sewer system. This was a public entity that was basically <coughs> pumping sewage into the harbor. That was sort of the design of it. Whereas in this case, we had a whole host of developers build an entirely new urban district at sea level, on landfill, hard on the coast, and despite you know, a city having more climate scientists per capita than just about any other city on the planet, <laughs> we built it in the bullseye of rising seas well after we understood the threats of rising seas. And I believe all of you guys were, were on the side saying, hey, there's, a, there's an issue here. So I just think there's a difference because, you know, it was people earning a lot of money to build these buildings and then they got out, a lot of them. So anyway, finish what you're saying, sorry. No, no, definitely. I mean, I'm not, <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not defending the seaport over here. Well, I guess what I'm saying is, um, you know, when you, when you step back and you think about, um, you know, what are we doing in this moment, right? This, what, what are the lessons we can do today, the choices we can make today? Across the country, we're investing in so many different ways, right? And how do we learn this lesson of, of equity? So that when, when it comes to this moment where everyone's sitting in a theater looking at a neighborhood and saying, well, was that for me? Who was that for? Um, you know, that we, we shouldn't 10, 15 years from now be looking back on this moment and having that same experience, right? And that's why, you know, as part of the way that we're doing investments now in the federal government, we're requiring many of our programs to ensure that 40% of the benefits go to communities that have been overburdened, have been marginalized. But, you know, that's, when you look at the seaport, that, that's not the story you see, right? And so when folks, I mean, how many, how many folks here um, when, feel like the seaport was built for them? <laughs> Thank you. We have one courageous soul. So, so you know, when you, when you then ask everybody to say, okay, let's come together for this giant collective action problem to protect our community, including the seaport, it's really hard to build the coalition. So you have to be really inclusive from the beginning if you actually want to think about good climate outcomes at the end. I think, could I just build on Sanjay's point real quick and go back to your question about the harbor-wide barrier? Because um, that exact point is why at the Stone Living Lab we have federal, state, local government, a nonprofit at Boston Harbor now and a research institution at UMass Boston all coming together and partnering with neighborhood groups and nonprofits like our friends over here at the uh, Boston Children's Museum to make sure that we are having uh, you know, many, many voices and diverse voices at the table. And it is worth noting that, you know, I, I know you, you didn't uh, cover it in the film, but there was a study on the harbor-wide barrier. <laughs> Uh, written from UMass Boston by my colleague Paul Kirshen that really analyzed whether or not that was a viable option for Boston and concluded that, that it wasn't for, for a host of reasons. Um, amongst them, its inability to address uh, sea level rise, you know, and focusing more on storm surge, but also we need, we need adaptation now, and that would be a 30-year project, you know. Right, and I think north of $11 billion. That's right. I just want to add to, um, I think the seaport more than anything is just purely a market failure in that, as you mentioned, the folks who were, so all of the seaport was permitted before the Great Recession. None of us were talking about imminent sea level rise. So when we were at the Boston Harbor Association, uh, we put out maps in 2010 showing all of this, you know, like if Boston were flooded with five feet, seven and a half feet of sea level rise or of ocean for whatever reason, tides, storm, sea level, these are the places that would flood. And it's all those filled lands that Nancy Seashoals talked about. Nobody cared, nobody cared. And then um, we were, as Ellen was saying in the, uh, in the film yesterday when she was speaking, we were putting the finishing touches on our white paper about sea level 
uh, you know, as, store, as uh, Sandy hit us, my house was shaking. And we ripped that up and, you know, because it had been like, when our poor grandchildren have to deal with this? <laughs> and then Sandy hit and we said, when we have to deal with this today, um, we did know, but all of those buildings had been permitted and they didn't want to re-permit. And that just the one last thing, all of the eds and meds who had forever business models did elevate their buildings at the same time that all the short-term flippers didn't. And I wonder if Yanni Sif is talking about the new seaport, which I'd never heard as a phrase, was saying these are the things that were permitted after the first flush of permits that like just wanted right. to go through. It, it, just the only thing I would say in response is that um, we are still permitting development there. And this leads to my next and final question before we turn it over to the audience. Um, going forward, should we continue to build in the seaport um, and approve other new coastal uh, development projects, such as what's envisioned just uh, a few a mile or two from here uh, in Dorchester Bay, which is a proposed 5 billion 21 building, 36-acre project on Columbia Point uh, that is sometimes referred to as Seaport 2. So um, uh, any volunteers, Sanjay, I think uh, you're, it's your turn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That, that's very equitable of you. Someone else gets to start each time. So, um, you know, I have my federal government hat on, but what I can say about Dorchester Bay City, um, you know, it does feel like a sequel. Right? Oh, yeah. State owned, mostly a parking lot, beautiful waterfront views, actually more near term flood risk in some ways than parts of the seaport. 100%. So, so no one really likes the sequel to a series, right? <laughs> and hopefully, we're not making a trilogy here. You, you could be in business for a while, David. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think if you look at what they've done, it's, it is a different, it has learned some of the lessons of the seaport. And then there's some lessons yet to be learned. I think one of the biggest challenges with something like um, you know, engaging the private sector in some of this public work is um, differences in timing and differences in incentives. And without getting into the super kind of nerdiness of it, it's just that um, you know, this, this proposal for this essentially neighborhood um, not too far from here um, is integrating elevation as a part of its work. And yet, some of the resilience things that it's going to do aren't coming until later phases of the project. How, how much elevation, though? So I think it's like 21.5 feet Boston City base. And anyway, it's like it's preparing right. for 2070 um, based upon the Massachusetts Coastal Flood Risk Model for, for the flood wonks in the room. But basically what it means is there is a certain amount of flood risk that it's going to deal with. But some of that work won't happen until later. So. It can be tricky, right? Because then who what, pay, you know, the real estate pay can change. Who pays for it? Late? Like, will the developers who promised to be building that coastal resilience still be there whenever that well, is supposed to kick so, in? So that, that's the question in every case, right? When you are, when you are trying to build a long-term relationship, um, you know, the, 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 the greatest long-term owner in the city of Boston is the city of Boston, right? You can depend on the city of Boston to believe that it should be here 100 years from now. But if you need to depend on phase two or phase three of a project to protect phase one, you know, that's a risk that a city might choose to take. And you have to think about the trade-offs. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, not wearing my city hat anymore, I won't like opine on what they should or shouldn't do. Um, but you really do need to think about the trade-offs because there's a lot of incentives that you might give to incent new development. Um, and part of that trade is hopefully that produces a protected neighborhood versus a neighborhood um, that repeats you know, lessons that the city should have already learned. May I just add to what you said, though? The key word, fetch. And if you're a mariner, the word fetch is the distance that wind and waves can kick up. and. Um, Columbia Point is so much more at risk from our worst storms, which are nor'easters, than the seaport. 
that what would be okay in the seaport in terms of basically 10 feet above today's high tide is, is roughly what you're talking about in height. Um, they're going to get so much more wind and wave action here. And you can see it on the flood maps that basically you've got this really long fetch coming off of Winthrop and nailing the end of um, Carson Beach, right where that new development be, in a way that it bypasses the seaport. Just asking for Rachel, is the JFK library going to survive? No, this, <laughs> we're, we're way up on a bluff. It's, no, it's we're, nothing's going to happen here. We're on a bluff. But, but they are right at the end of what had been wetlands. You know, the same thing with Suffolk Downs. You look at all the flood maps, and there's Suffolk Downs in the middle of a puddle. Why would you spend money there as opposed to, you know, Worcester, Belmont, Belmont, not Marshfield? You know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's clues. <laughs> you know? There are clues. <laughs> I, I'm taking you on tour with me. Yeah. <laughs> Go. <laughs> you know, if, if we really oversimplify the question and just say, should we be building in areas that are, you know, vulnerable to sea level rise and coastal storms? No. I mean, the common sense answer is no, right? But you, you <laughs> but, but there's a but there. It's, it's not that simple though, right? You have a growing region. You have housing demands. You have, you know, the tax revenue that is, is supplying, you hit on it in the documentary, that is funding the things many, I'm sure all people in this room care about, like public education, like affordable housing, like transportation. Yeah. Where is the funding for that coming through? It's coming through developments like that. So that is where the debate gets really nuanced. And to oversimplify it is kind of a disservice to climate resilience, but also to all those other topics. So it's really, and, and that's why we can't communicate about it in you know 280 characters. It has to be totally. in really in-depth conversations like this and, and in you know policy debate. I think that's a fully you know important point. Um, uh, I think it's more a question, in my eyes, of how we built. Um, all right, that's uh, enough for me. So uh, we uh, would be happy to hear questions from you guys. I didn't mean to say it's over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't choke on your gum. That's terrifying. I was really happy that you guys mentioned um, Suffolk Downs and uh, Dorchester Bay City because, you know, it's just so silly to throw any money in those places and, and, and not plan 100 years down the road. And also, if there's going to be anything built there and any profit to be made, then that profit has to be driven back into uh, an environmental justice program. Um, and I want to just also raise uh, White at Circle, because that's been talked about, and it's, you know, end of the four-point channel. And could you address? Uh, what your vision would be for an ecological, uh, environmental justice use or, or repurpose of White at Circle in terms of what we're facing. White at Circle, just to add, is uh, the area where uh, some folks envisioned, I think our last mayor envisioned hosting uh, the Olympics <laughs> and creating a stadium that would last in perp perpetuity. Who uh, would like to take that? Well, AKA South Bay, which kind of gives you another sense of. <laughs> There's clues. There's Sometimes. clues in their old names. Yeah. You know, I mean, so I would not put any affordable housing on anything that used to be called a bay. Um, so maybe it's a good thing that um, the seaport is very high end because, in fact, the folks who live in the seaport can go to a hotel. And I'm, you know, I'm not kidding, you know, but I would say when we talk about resilient areas, oftentimes we're talking about areas that need more resilience. We should really be talking about what can we do uphill, out of the wind, not subject to flooding, not subject to heat, really. If we're really talking about the folks who are most on the edge and can't afford to get out of harm's way, let's get those buildings out of harm's way. Thank you for joining us today. I'm the representative for your online attendees, and we have the question, shouldn't the developers and those businesses in the seaport pay? 
Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you win points for being succinct. So, but, but you know, they, it's, it is important to note that they are providing benefits and protection for parts of the city in a lot of developments. Right. The, you use the example of Dorchester Bay City. You know, if the resilience plans for that are are fully, you know, uh, implemented, it will protect parts of this neighborhood. It will protect public, you know, transportation. It will protect other infrastructure. So that is happening throughout the city, where where developers are providing a benefit. I mean, you know, Clippership Wharf in East Boston is another example. You know, that is yes, it's blocking off a, a public housing development from the waterfront. That's true. But its elevation and its other, um, you know, approaches are uh, the living shoreline there are also helping protect that from rising seas and storms. So it is a balance, um, and some developments are helping to increase the resilience of the city by being sacrificial lambs. Well, well, in, in, a, in a way, um, <laughs> but, but by by implementing things like a raise in elevation and, and a living shoreline, at, at an example like you know Clippership Wharf. Yeah, I think what, what I can add to that is it's also a question of, of how you pay. So one, one of the things in the climate space um, you know, it's worth thinking about is um, when you're in a region that's in a housing crunch, how do you think about um, the, the impact of climate work on development and, and the cost of housing? Um, you know, that's very real for people. Um, and there's clear solutions to that, but how you structure the involvement of people in paying for public infrastructure is really important because it, if you kind of impose broad fees in a really uh, flat way, um, you can have an unintended consequence in other parts of policy conversations that we're trying to have too. So I think there's obviously, obviously a solution in this space, but it requires a much more nuanced conversation that sometimes is hard to have you know, in, a, in a setting like this, but it is, um, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity to not just protect and think just about protecting neighborhoods, but focusing on protecting people, right? Because I think, I think we get so focused on the real estate. Real estate drives this conversation so much, but that's only because there's just so much interest in that space. Um, focusing on protecting people and their livelihoods that's right. will give you a really different sense of what climate solutions could look like. And I think to the earlier question, right, when you think about what does justice look like? Or what, what does equity look like in the context of climate resilience? It is shifting the policy gaze from uh, buildings and real estate to people and livelihoods. Because then you start thinking about, OK, well, you know, maybe it's about protecting um, someone's ability to um, you know, access food in a certain way. Maybe it's about protecting someone's ability to uh, have a safe commute you know, during a heat wave. You know, there's a lot of other solutions besides you know, sitting in the sandbox and trying to like, you know, keep the water out from your kind of castle that you built. There's a lot of other ways to think about climate resilience that I think allow us to think more broadly about equity than just the story that the seaport often is, which is shiny building, put up a wall. Like That doesn't really tell you the full story of what we can do for climate work in Boston. Can I pull some threads together as well? So John Sullivan talked about, hey, we could just elevate the harbor walk. So I want to try to coin another phrase of the dry line, right? We've got this 47 mile long harbor walk. That's exactly as long as we need it to be to elevate just for Boston. It needs to go beyond for other communities. But having the harbor walk be actually a quite joyful thing that could even create some economic goodness because it becomes part of why people come to Boston and protects us. I think the other thing, though, that um, a number of folks in your movie said was this exponential sea level curve accelerates over time. And when we look at what, what we can do to protect the coastline of Massachusetts, the whole coastline was, was salt marshes, essentially. We don't have a lot of elevation. As Mayor Wu said, 30% of downtown Boston is fill and really only, only as high as they thought they needed to go before they ever thought about sea level rise. We can shore things up today for about 50 years. How great it would be if that bought us time to move upstairs and inland and allow this to be Venice or allow this to be Salt Marsh again. But it's you know having planned retreat rather than uneven and unfair retreat. But the retreat's not going to not happen. 
Venice or Atlantis? Venice or Atlantis? Hey. 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 Good name. <laughs> Thank you all so much for sharing your insights and you're such leaders in this space. And I know it's really easy when you're seeing these images and living in this world and doing this work to feel despair and frustration, just exceptional frustration of what are we doing? Why aren't we doing enough? And I think that some of the things I all just heard from you is opportunity and hope. And I think that that's what brings us all to this space is we don't come to you know watch a devastation. We come because we want to feel inspired and hope. And I'd be curious to hear from each of you where you find that, where you see that when you're faced with this really stark reality. Yeah, uh, that's that's such a great question. It's an important one. I'll say um, it. It's important to watch films twice sometimes, right? Or, or maybe more. And I'm not just, it's not just a, a pitch for David's a film. But the, the first time I watched this, I, <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I came away um, thinking it was a really cynical take. And that's not the sort of um, ethos that we have at the Stone Living Lab. You know, we try to uh, really bring people together with a very realistic understanding of the risk, but with optimism about what can collaboratively be done together. Um, you know, but the second time I watched it today, I don't know if I was in a better mood or what it was, but um, you, you do close with, I think, some real optimism in, in showing what some of the amazing work the city's doing and highlighting so many, you know, wonderful people that are dedicated to this. So I, I think that, you know, it's through collaboration with colleagues like this. And for those of you that don't know, Julie is an incredibly talented climate resilience expert herself. Um, and so, you know, it, it's through that type of collaboration that I think that, that optimism comes from. Yeah, um, I, I, think, I think a lot, I, you know, about a month ago, I gave a talk on climate grief and climate despair and the distinctions between them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, um, it was actually after the first time we tried to do this and um, um, some folks who I think were feeling a lot of despair kind of interrupted the entire event, protested, and shut it down. I felt grief afterward. You felt <laughs> grief, right? And I think, I think they might have been feeling despair, right? And I think there is, or I'm not going to speak for them. That's a little unfair. But I think this distinction is helpful because when you notice yourself more in despair mode, it's just good to notice, right? So when I th one thing to keep an eye on, because we'll be doing this climate work for a while, and it can be kind of grueling, um, is to notice when you're experiencing something like a meaningful loss. Like, oh, I'm seeing that, you know, the places that I go to are changing. I'm seeing cherry blossoms in D.C. in December instead of April. You know, that can create a sense of grief, a sense of loss or um, unanchoredness. But it's kind of public, right? Grief, grief is something we experience together. And then there's despair, which is something we experience alone. It's solitary. Mm. And it's a loss that's not meaningful because you believe that it's faded, you know, things can't be different. And so, you know, when folks say, you know, we're stuck with climate change, we just have to, to deal with it. We're, you know, this is, we're, we live on, you know, when, when they're feeling that sense of like closure, like there's no path forward, there's plenty of people that feel that too. And so I guess what I would say, maybe just a, a, a version of a response to your question is, um, People in the climate space are feeling like everything all at once. What's the name of that movie? Everything, yeah, everywhere, yeah, all at once. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's all those, right? Like some days you're just like despairing, right? You're like, I, you know, I can't believe this is where we're at. And then some days you're grieving. I feel like where I get hope is um, in doing the work, right? Because I think so much of despair or grief comes from not having a great way to act. And so for those who are feeling that way, how many people are feeling? that way like they're they're feeling like yeah i mean i see almost yeah i see a lot of hands right so i think finding finding a way to act even if it's within your sphere even with, even if you're not doing this professionally like us um especially if you're not doing this professionally i think is really important to process the grief in a way that kind of helps i don't know if that's that was a really rambly answer but that's what i'm thinking you sent me in a totally different direction because um, one of the places I find hope and beauty is I work with 20 communities. We've raised $125 million, mostly in the last two years, 
for beautiful equity-centered climate resilience projects. We just took, you know, we were good surfers, but thank God for the wave of federal funding that, you know, really, so we've made progress. And I think when you're in action, it is, you get more hope. But, but I wanna actually say that what shifted me from despair to strength was this quote that I came across um, last summer. And I, I, I know that I've said it to you. This is a guy who was a, a congregational minister on the coast of Maine in Blue Hill. And so when he talks about his mountain, the mountain's a thousand feet tall. It's not very mountainy, but, but um, I realized that really since the Trump administration, not just because I'm obviously a Democrat, but also because this is collective action project and here, our country is splitting apart just when we need to come together. I was just feeling depressed. And this quote actually um, really shifted things for me all at once. So he says, our mountain is the mountain of the world. Our village is all villages of the world. Our time is all times. If the day of judgment is coming, if Armageddon is around the corner, if this time is the end time, how do we want to be found by the Creator? Anxious and confused? Angry and bitter about faraway events? Hmm. Condemning and judging those around us? Wounding further the wounded? Scrambling for a ticket to heaven? Or do we want to be found binding up wounds in our own villages, comforting our neighbors who mourn, and freeing those who are captives of pain and fear? It's like, that's it, and, right? And you know, people go through terrible things, but you're like, how can I be, who can I be for my community? And that, that did shift me out of despair, for sure. I would uh, answer that question with less poetry. Two words. <laughs> Prosaic guy. Nuclear fusion. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Shall I? Go ahead. I'll stop so, there. Well, that was, it's hard, it's hard to segue into. Because um, <laughs> I, I may sound a bit naive, but I think the, the mitigation strategies that I've read about, you know, that's great, and those, that will buy us time. And they're really important, and they're innovative. There's that whole equity piece, which I think is great. And that which we need to protect, of course, is, is vast. It's not just the seaport district. I lived in the South End. I lived in, on, off a of Four Point Channel for five years and then the South End six years prior to that. And I remember all the flooding and, and the inundation. Um, I have to say I'm very impressed, just briefly, very impressed with Bill Golden's work. And um, Boston has a tradition of, of uh, manipulating the land. And I think there's strength in looking back at that and seeing how, you know, talking about buying time. So if you have that mitigation strategy, you know, the pods floating, that strategy is important. And that should be front end. But we may need to buy time, a, a, a longer window of time, which I think some of these hardwired barrier ideas uh, could do for us. So I, know I get a little discouraged when I hear about one or two reports that said we really shouldn't go in that direction. Maybe, sure, maybe the Dutch aren't relying on that kind of technology like they used to. I, I haven't studied those trends. But I, I have to say I'm a little skeptical that we wouldn't resort to some of that kind of planning because it's, it's in our tradition. I mean, we did this with the Back Bay. We did it with you know, the, the old Charles Dam, Charles River Dam, the new Charles River Dam, the Big Dig. You know, if we, and I'll, I'll segue out. You know, we, we, we're talking about flooding of the central artery, we, we, you know, the need to keep all that infrastructure moving and vital. Like you were saying, that's where all the revenue comes from to pay for all these schools. I mean, to think, keep things going, hopefully it'll all moss over over time, which become, could become a greener world. But I guess my question is, is don't you see a place for this, you know, this sort of barrier approach? Um, isn't that somewhat inevitable if we want, really want to give us a longer, a longer window? with which to, to eventually retreat. I mean, we'll, be, we'll all be long gone, but in 100 years when that retreat needs to become a reality, perhaps the barrier would give us the time we need to get organized 
and make that happen, um, you know, evolve effectively. So I wish it worked as a short answer. And the biggest reason it doesn't work is that um, we have this giant slosh between Cape Cod and Nova Scotia. So even though we could drive to Fall River and New Bedford very easily, our tide is 10 feet and their tide is four feet. And it, it's the difference between it succeeding and failing. The, we also have back doors to the tide coming in via Chelsea Creek and, and on the other side of Hull. And so f that barrier would have to completely enclose the harbor and beyond, and beyond Winthrop to Revere. Um, the if it was a harbor-wide barrier, it could the be harbor -wide a, barrier. In, it could be a, a inner harbor barrier. You could potentially have an inner harbor barrier between the airport and downtown, and that would help a little bit, but you don't necessarily need it. The big issue, because you could just elevate the shoreline, and that would do the same thing. But the, the thing about the harbor-wide barrier is that's a massive amount of water going in and out. You squeeze that into two openings, you have a six-knot current going in and out. It's a, it's a navigation hazard. The other difference about a 10-foot tide versus a four-foot tide is the difference between our astronomical high tide and our 1,000-foot flood is three and a half feet. Like, we don't get giant storm surges. Like, New York, Superstorm Sandy is an astronomical high tide and then a nine-foot storm surge. We can't physically get a storm surge that high. So we don't have that big difference between high tide and storm surge. So by the time we need to start closing a harbor barrier, it's about 15 years till you have to start closing it once a month. And it's so big that you don't necessarily know that it's going to reopen, because ours would be much bigger than um, New Bedford. So it's, it's the mechanics of it. It's not the, I, w I, wish, it were, I wish it worked. So forgive, so forgive me, is that conclusive? I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's no not about way. the... There's no other way of looking at that. Well, you could close off the barrier. Yeah. Like, you could close off the harbor yeah. and repollute it. Well, no, you wouldn't. No, I mean, but that's, that's how it could work. Yeah. But if you wanted to say it as a, a harbor with flow, it doesn't work, unfortunately. Oh. I, I think... No, oh, no, go ahead, Julie. No, it's just, it's too bad. Uh, I, w I wish it worked, but... And, and I guess one, one thing I would offer in this conversation is... Um, you know, you can spend money on something really literal, right? Or you can spend money on solutions that provide many more benefits besides just flood protection, right? Because it's, you know, the folks in the room here really care about climate resilience, really care about protecting from flooding, right? But, you know, everybody needs to buy into these ideas and needs to feel like they benefit them too, right? I think the lesson of the seaport is that projects like you know, major infrastructure projects that are so driven in that way sometimes fail to pull people along with them to the point where in the room, folks don't feel like it was built for them or don't feel like that neighborhood. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, could we imagine a world where the ways in which we protect ourselves from flooding also, you know, helps clean up our air, clean up our water, give people more access to open space Cool um, yeah, yeah. Co cool ourselves off, maybe increase access to food production, incre increase, um, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is how do we grow the pie versus focus on this kind of zero-sum game that it's about a barrier or it's about coast protection? You know, I think, I think there's a broader story here. And I, I think both Julie and Sanjay are, are, are right on with what they said, and I'll just I'll elaborate a little bit that you're right in that all solutions should be considered, right? We should always be considering all solutions and not be dismissing anything. But when they've been studied pretty thoroughly and, and you know, had a you know, indication that this is really not something that is beneficial for the region, for people, or for nature, Julie didn't even mention the ecological benefits of, of that you know, opening and uh, the ecological, sorry, detriment of that. It's, it's really, really bad. Um, but yes, all, all solutions should be considered. What's, what's most important, what I take away from your question, is the examples you cited of the harbor cleanup, of the big dig. Yeah. These were people coming together 
around an idea that benefited nature, benefited the region, benefited people, and, and it was inspirational. I mean, you have one of the leaders of the Harbor Cleanup sitting right here, and, and you know, Kathy Douglas Stone. You know, it, it, it's, it was an inspiration, and it was an idea, and it's what brought people together, and that's what I take away from your question. That's what we continue to need to do right now, and, and I think, and we are doing, and forums like this help with that. I'll just say, Bill Golden has yet to see the film, but he's going to see the film tomorrow, and he's going to appear on a panel. Uh, we're taking the film to the Salem Film Festival, so I will, uh, I will put uh, some of these critiques to him uh, in front of that audience. Sorry, you can't benefit from that. Last, this is the last question. Oh, phew, I got in. <laughs> First of all, I just want to say thank you for uh, doing all these screenings, because I think it's so important to to our community. Um, I live in a hull, um, which is experiencing some of the similar things that the seaport is, along with a lot of the other um, communities surrounding Boston. And so what we're dealing with is some opposing views at the state level, which is build more housing. You know, there's a housing crisis, and there are um, some demands to build more housing. And then on the other side, there is the coastal resiliency um, that's also coming down from the state. And so we've got these two opposing views that most coastal communities are dealing with right now. And so I wanted to ask for your sort of advice on, as a community member, how to approach this with um, key stakeholders who are making those decisions on build, don't build, build higher, build this, you know, and, and what we should be doing um, because we've got these pressures from both sides. And so you kind of answered it a little bit in that last, that last question, but I just wanted to see what you might suggest as a community member trying to make a difference and trying to make some changes so that we are not the next seaport and what they're dealing with. So. I really appreciate you you bringing that up because it's important. I think you know most people in this room probably know this, but but Boston isn't the only area of challenge, right? The Atlantic Ocean doesn't respect municipal boundaries, right? And so places like Hull, places like Swampscott on the North Shore, you know, you're you're having there are these microcosms of all the challenges that Boston is facing, but in a much smaller area too, right? You know, three miles of coastline in Swampscott as opposed to 47 in Boston. And um, you're having the debates in a, a much more finite way as well. I know there's a, a big you know, uh, uh, planning effort around considering planned retreat in Hull and parts of Hull as well. And so I think that it's really tough to balance those competing interests, uh, especially when you're you know, keeping equity at the forefront of the conversation. And I, I think that you know, having the type of public debates that I've been to and seen in Hull is the way to do it, and making sure that you're getting as many voices to the table as possible. I don't know if there's a, a right answer on which one is more important, because it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, yeah I, and you know, I, th I think, a lot, like Joe said, a lot of communities are going through this challenge, because you don't get one challenge at once. You often have to deal with everything all at once. And so um, you know, looking for areas that are upland, that have opportunities for increased density, um, you know, that's what a lot of communities do, right? And then they lock it into the rules for how you build. They lock it into your zoning. And so, you know, what it does is, I mean, the, the challenge, right, in places like Hall is there's a lot of um, single family ownership or duplex. There's, there's sometimes more low density or moderate density kind of housing strategies. And so usually what people do when they're trying to add a bunch of housing to a community without fun changing the zoning is they'll put it in the low-lying areas, to Julie's point, right? They'll put affordable housing or new housing um, in area that was vacant, right? Which is often formerly industrial land in some of these communities, right? right? So you have to clean it up, and then it's low-lying. So I think um, this is probably not helpful for you, right? <laughs> Just us like <laughs> pointing out the challenges that you face in home, and you probably know them better than we do, but I guess I would say is, um, the transformation that we need to go through to not only address the climate crisis, but the equity crisis is, is immense. And it challenges things that are really locked in, right? Like maybe, maybe the eight or nine homes on high elevation that are single family, and like two people live in there part time and they also live in Florida. You know, like that, maybe that is a question, right? That we need to ask, how are we taking care of 
all of the members of our community, including the people that don't live here yet, but are looking for a home and are paying 60% of their income on rent. So I, not an answer, but just recognizing the tension that communities like Hall are facing. Yeah, and I would just say, so downtown Boston has 34 Harbor Islands in between the big storms so, and, and downtown Boston. So a, a wave in Massachusetts Bay that's 30 feet tall, by the time it gets to the islands, it's two feet tall when it hits the aquarium. Hull has hull in the way, <laughs> right? And so, you know, if, if there's a single piece of advice is like really take those flood maps seriously and, and then some, because you're gonna have terrible storms on the ocean side. And so if you're gonna build new housing, don't, build it on the Boston Harbor side, build it, build it up. You know, and, and also look at places like Iceland. You know, look at storm-driven places and how they build. Yeah. You know, because it, Hull's going to have to look different to be the same, yeah. right? So uh, I will just uh, end by saying uh, thank you all for uh, your great questions. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you to the JFK Library for organizing this. Thank you to this amazing panel uh, for a really great, thoughtful conversation. And the final thing I'll say is that we hope to bring this film to as many people in this city and beyond as possible. So if you uh, appreciated this film, please uh, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, uh, post about it on social media. That's helpful. So thank you all very much. We appreciate it. <laughs>